Our reputation was obviously as a residential contractor. How else Canadian market is different from US marketing? I think Canada is probably really similar. Uh, do you pay installers more to work in the winter time? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're pretty tight on the safety side here. Staggering, no underlayment, no ice and water. Where does that happen? Uh, what about manufacturer instructions? They're different for Canada. Do you guys shovel the snow? Because I see so many pictures from Canada that guys are literally installing shingles in a snowstorm. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we go in a snowstorm, but I think snow is easier than rain, right? Because snow, you shovel off the shingles, you rip the shingles, it's dry underneath. So, and if you just need to shovel a little snow off, it's not a big deal. Rain's going straight through into the attic. It must be Canadian thing. In US, northern markets, we stop. So you guys don't stop? We'll go, and I said minus 10, probably minus five is a bit more realistic. Um, but yeah, we'll go throughout the winter and, and we offer a lifetime workmanship warranty. So if a shingle ever comes off, we're going back to, to help out with that. Assuming it's a workmanship issue. Uh, do you pay installers more to work in the winter time? <laughs> no, <laughs> the installer, the installers just get paid <laughs> whether it's summer or winter. So it's, I think you can get away of, uh, from OSHA violations because you have a lot of snow. You know, it's a safety cushion. If you fall off the roof, you just fall in the snow, right? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're pretty tight on the safety side here. When I was shingling back in the day, man, we, we were never in harness, right? 20 years ago kind of thing. But now everybody's in harness. Doesn't matter if it's a 412, one story, like you're just harnessed up if you're on the roof now. So it's d new days right now. Is this your, uh, so this is your background. You were actually a roofer uh, years ago. I did, uh, I did about a year and a half of shingling before I realized this was not what I wanted to do with my life. So, <laughs> so I went, I did some real estate stuff. I went and did an MBA and then I actually ran a denim line, a blue jeans company. So yeah, so that's where I got more into the, how, you know, fashion, it's all about differentiating. How do you stand out in a marketplace where a t-shirt's a t-shirt is a t-shirt? Like, same thing with roofing, right? Shingle is a shingle is a shingle. So how do you stand out? And it's got to be that brand. So that's kind of what led me down more of the path. But, uh, but after I, I sold that uh, denim brand, then I bought into this roofing company and, and you know, one of the owners and worked here for 10 years and then got into Sumo Coat. So it's, it's a bit of a different approach to roofing for sure. Love it. Um, do you guys see already Chinese shingles on your market. I've heard some Canadian companies have been installing some Chinese shingles. Have you touched, feel, seen them? I haven't yet. So yeah, no, I haven't at all. We've got uh, we've got an IKO plant right in our in our city here. So IKO was the dominant player for here for years, but uh, OCs gobbled up a lot of market share. And then in our market, BP is actually probably number three. Malarkey is in there quite a bit as well. Uh, so let's start with the Epic Roofing. Why would I choose Epic Roofing for my roofing project? Why would I hire you? Yeah, I mean, Epic's been around for almost 20 years. So it's not this fly-by-night type of approach, you know, where homeowners, they're not sure their contractor's here today, gone tomorrow, tomorrow type of thing, right? So... Uh, so we've been around for a couple of decades. We're well established in the community here and, and our reputation um, is really strong. So this is your home, right? This is, you got to keep this thing dry. You got to keep it protected. So uh, you want to go with a company that you know is going to be around to make sure that it's protected, not just on day one, but you know, day 10,000. So what's the failure uh, uh, rate looks like in canada how many roofers fail after they open the roofing business how is it different from american model because in america the failure rate of small business is pretty high i would assume canada is pretty close with those numbers or is it very different i think canada is probably really similar um, when we're looking at the market we tend to be looking at companies that would be our competitors so companies that have been around for 
you know, 10, 15 years sort of thing, and they've got a more established brand. We're not typically looking at subcontractors that might do, um, you know, the odd additional job here and there. Um, that's, that wouldn't be something that we could monitor as closely. So when we're looking at those more established brands, they tend to be around a lot longer. In our market, we've seen a couple of them drop off just because the economy has been tough in recent years and we haven't had as much hail. Um, having said that, we had a massive hailstorm this last year, so that's been, that's been pretty incredible for our business. Are you a commercial or residential contractor? Yeah, we do both. So we started in the residential space. And so we're about two thirds, one third right now, about two thirds residential, one third commercial. Um, having said that, our commercial division, I mean, I'm super proud of it. Our commercial division isn't um, just sort of doing some small flat repairs and some, uh, some residential flat roofs. We're, we're going in on a lot of the big stuff. And one of the areas we've had a lot of success actually is in building envelope. So that we're not just doing the flat roofing on top, we're, we're getting into a lot more technical stuff in building envelope um, on the, with the sidings and the metals and claddings and all that stuff as well. So, so they've been, yeah, I, like I said, I've been really proud of how well our commercial division has done and how quickly they've grown there. How commercial sales are different from residential sales? I know a lot of guys in our community are trying to get in commercial sales. Uh, I get the questions a lot. People want to consult, they're tired of residential or it's not enough or they want to scale. What kind of tips, pointers would you give to the business owner who killed it in a residential and trying to tap into a commercial? Yeah, it's a good question. I know, I certainly know the residential side far better. That's the side that I come from. On the commercial side, it, it takes time and it takes reputation. So our reputation was obviously as a residential contractor. You know, that's where we grew and were well known in our, in our city. And so we had to be in it for a bit more of the long haul. And, and we took some losses the first couple of years on the commercial side. But in order to develop our crews, in order to take on projects where we were learning as we were going. And so um, in order to still get the highest level of quality, you've got to go slower, but you've still got to compete price wise. And so it's tough. So it does take a bit more time to go through that. I know on the commercial side, our service portion there. Service is always, I just think, a massive opportunity. If you can serve well, you're going to get lots of opportunity um, on the, the larger replacement shops. So, um, yeah, our service division has been something we focused on, both residen residential and commercial, for sure. How different is the sales process, like selling to commercial manager, property manager versus selling to the homeowner? You know, I don't know if I can comment entirely on that because I haven't done commercial sales. Um, certainly there's the property managers, but in commercial sales, you're starting to go more to the GCs, right? To all the large general contractors out there. And the interesting with the thing with the GCs is it's reputation, but it's price. Like they grind you down on price in a big way, especially in a tough economy. So yeah, you've got to, you've got to work a bit harder to try and get, establish the relationship. Um, and then try and go after, uh, on the commercial side, it's can you get into um, relationships with property managers, but also with some of the, the large REITs or the large real estate investment groups where you can start to service a, a bunch of buildings all through a single relationship. So um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't gone deep on the commercial side, but that's my understanding is single relationship can result in way more roofs Residential, obviously, you're, you're typically at one relationship is one roof type of thing. You mentioned several times that uh, uh, Canada economy kind of tanked the last few years. Besides economy, how else Canadian market is different from U.S. market in your observation? You know what? The big part in our region here is the insurance side. Because in Calgary, Alberta, where we are, uh, insurance, we're, we're sort of the we're the Dallas Fort Worth or we're the Denver of Canada. So we're the market that typically gets really consistent hail. Um, and in our region here, door knocking isn't nearly as big as it is down in the South. That's something, um, you know, contingency agreements. We don't, we don't use contingency agreements. That's just, that hasn't been our approach to things. Um, our approach 
has more been uh, working as a preferred contractor for insurance companies. Um, and so it's different because a lot of the time we'll go out there, we know their specs, they might send us out there actually as the field adjuster in some ways. So they trust us to take the photos, to put together the Xactimate report, to do it according to their guidelines. And obviously we're motivated to get every single line item we can possibly get on there. But then we're the first ones out there, we can establish relationship with the homeowner earlier. And um, yeah, we tend to close a lot more deals that way by being a strong partner with some of the insurance companies and obviously picking and choosing which ones we want to work with because there's, you know, we all know there's good insurance companies and bad insurance companies out there. I keep seeing uh, online pictures from the jobs, let's call it of lowest quality. It looks like nobody cares. Uh, no permits and uh, I keep seeing comments on those pictures that not all Canada is like that It's just like that one region So what region of Canada where like you can install roofs with staggering no underlayment No ice and water. Where is that happening? It's it's building code So the in, so another interesting thing in Canada here is we're not nearly as established as the United States is in uh, sort of lobby groups or associations. Those aren't nearly as strong in Canada. The US is far more mature and, and has gone down that path way further. So as, as a result of that, the homeowners don't end up being as well protected because the, uh, the, the building codes just aren't, aren't brought up to speed as quickly. So yes, you do in our region, uh, full underlayment isn't a requirement. That's not building code in our region. But is it best practice? It, we, but 100%, that's what we install in every job because it's a best practice. And at least what we've started to see in the last five to 10 years here is that all of our competitors that we're bidding against are all bidding full ice and water and full synthetic. So, so the industry is moving along a lot faster than the government is here. Love it. But how do you compete with that? If, if it's not official requirement, if building code does not call for it, and someone's providing a bid that's 30% less than yours, how do you explain, how do you compete um, in the marketplace? I mean, you've always got to compete off of value, right? So we're, I think in Alberta here, I think we're the largest residential roofing contractor in our province. And so with that, we just, we, we take for granted that we're never going to be the cheapest. And, uh, and we don't want to play the price game. So we've got to make sure that we're showing the homeowner that we're going to give them a better experience, that we're going to give them better warranty, um, that our production department is more sophisticated, that we're going to make sure that we've got a better approach to business, which is going to give them a better, uh, a better home at the end of the day. So yeah, we've got to make sure we're competing on value. Uh, is your business uh, works a lot with insurance companies? We do. Uh, insurance companies have been changing here quite a bit though. Deductibles have been going up and one of the big differences for, uh, for Canadian insurance companies here is pretty much all of them. It's non-recoverable depreciation. And so that's a big hit for us when we're, so yes, we're first in through the door as a preferred, but ultimately the checks the homeowners are getting tend to be smaller than the ones in the U S. And so, we're the first in through the door, we've got a preferred warranty through the insurance company, but it means sometimes we have to negotiate when we don't want to, depending on the size of the storm that we're dealing with. So we, we've got to be a bit flexible with things. Uh, what are the big, biggest market challenges in Canada in 2021? Do you have labor shortages? Do you have material shortages? Uh, what are the ch business challenges now that you didn't have before? How COVID-19 hit you guys? All of that. I mean, I think you nailed it. Like this year, it's been labor and materials are the big ones. Um, we haven't felt the material squeeze quite as tight just because we've got some good relationships. Um, but I think the, the big one that whether it's this year or any year, I mean, it always comes down to cash. You need cash to run your business. And so this year, is a it's, it's kind of no different than any other year if you don't have strong banking facilities, if you don't have strong um, balance sheets, like if you haven't set yourself up for difficult situations, whether it's a really good situation, in which case you're buying a ton of material and you're not seeing your, your accounts receivables are building up, or that's a bad situation and you don't have as much work as you'd like in your pipeline, 
ultimately you've got to run a good business at the end of the day. And so by focusing on good business practices, that's, I mean, that, that's what it comes down to for the nuts and bolts of things every year. In Canada, I've seen something I've never seen in the United States. You have those guys uh, who um, I think you call them loaders who deliver shingles and they spread them on the roof and you pay them per square. Um, so it's not a supplier who does it. It's like third party. Just uh, what they do is like they take from the truck or from the boom and they carry it on the roof. Like what's up with that and how popular it is uh, still? Well, I, uh, I didn't even know that was a thing. So <laughs> like, sorry, I, I didn't realize that wasn't in the US. Um, it's mainly our distributors that are, that are doing all the loading. So that's the main thing. I know some of our distributors outsource to third parties. Um, and we actually, at, at one point, we went maybe two or three years where we, uh, we had a boom truck, we had our own crews, we did all of our own loading. Um, and that was, you know, that was just to continue. I mean, margins, you can get squeezed on margins so tight sometimes. You know, if you're a big enough company to start to do some of those things, that can be a big part of your actual net revenue at the end of the year. So, well, no, nobody, do, nobody does it in the U.S. Like you don't have loaders. Like it's a company's responsibility to send the crew to offload it from the boom truck. I mean, maybe in some pockets of the United States, but everywhere I go, I've never seen it. And you guys have a loaders and the, uh, those guys usually come day or two prior to the job, right? And then load it and spread, uh, distribute the weight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, so our distributor would be the one doing all of that. So they'll they'll go, they'll load it, they'll distribute everything. But you're the one paying for it. Uh, but we're paying for it. Yeah. So you know, it's like, yeah, the the fees are all worked in to your invoice at the end of the day on that. When we brought that in house, certainly we could we could save a few bucks with that and make a little bit more. Um, but the reason we ultimately went away from it was the WCB risk, the injury risk of those loaders is incredibly high. And, and so to have good, strong guys that are consistently there and healthy and, and aren't getting injured, that's difficult. That's something that we took into account where we just didn't want to take on the additional liability for our company. Tell me about Summa Quote. How did you come up with the idea? Uh, what's up with the name? Like, how did you come up with the Summa Quote name in the first place? That's my first question about Summa Quote. Yeah, the uh, the sumo quote name. Honestly, we we went through a million names, and it came down to just a URL that was available online. All the names people are just sitting on out there, and they think they're going to sell some website, some domain for a million dollars, and uh, and we just weren't willing to pay that. So we found sumo quote, and and actually the story. I I came home one day. You know, kids were out sort of playing on the sidewalk and stuff and our neighbors and their kids were out and everything else. And and I, I was chatting with my one neighbor and I said, so what do you think? So should we go do go quotes or sumo quote? And she said, just a second, I got to run inside. She runs inside, literally one minute later comes back out. She says, OK, sumo quote or what was the other one? And I'm like, exactly. It's it's memorable. It's you. You don't forget sumo quote. Wow. So that's the story. Yeah. I thought you were in sumo or something in the wrestling. Okay. Well, hell, no, I, uh, I put on a few pounds since launching Sumo Quote, but I'm certainly, it's not something I'm, I'm ambitiously aiming for from the weight side. Wow. Uh, tell me what Sumo Quote uh, solves and uh, what um, tools or um, it usually replaces. You know, like if I'm a roofer, and I sign up with you, what I'm gonna cancel? Is it a Google Docs? Is it my estimate? What, what usually it replaces? Yeah, so Sumo Quote is usually replacing, you know, uh, your estimating tool, your, um, in, your inspection tool, whatever you, you're sharing your inspections uh, with, uh, your brochures, all of your marketing pieces, um, your e-signing, DocuSign, or whatever you're using for that. So, so Sumo Quote's sort of replacing a whole bunch of those things. How I often describe it is Sumo Quote is if you think about taking, you know, your quote, your good, better, best, your just your quote, your upgrades that you're selling them, um, your brochure pages, your liability and copy of your liability insurance, um, sort of all of these things that you might be sending as three, four, five different files attached to an email. 
If you took all those things, you handed them to a professional graphic designer, and the professional graphic designer gave you back a quote and all in one to give to somebody, it's this full suite presentation that's put together that has e-signing and everything else built into it. So it ends up just looking far more professional than anything else out there. Is your e-sign uh, your proprietor e-sign or it's a DocuSign or third party? Uh, can they do it on the screen on their phone when you email it to them or how do they e-sign? Yeah, so it's something proprietary that we built directly into our software. You can, it follows obviously all of the legalities and laws that we need to, but yeah, right on your phone, on your tablet, wherever you need to. So it's fully mobile to sign in person, or you can email it over to the, the homeowner and have them sign it virtually or, or on their computer as well. Since you said the word uh, legality, I have a question about signature for you. Uh, years ago when I was running flooring business, I have this crazy, crazy story. I was selling carpet to one of the very picky, very bad person. Like uh, Later I found out he was a bad person. He was flipping houses, very cheap. And uh, I sold him a roofing job and he wanted upgrade. And I told him when I arrived, I said, if you want to upgrade to thicker carpet, 50 ounces, you have to pay more. And... Um, you know, he, uh, I think, so he calls me, says, my wife will sign it. I'm like, sure, like the change order, essentially. So I give her paperwork, she signed it, I never looked at it, and uh, I sent him invoice, and he paid the original invoice, did not pay for the upgrade. When I call, uh, when I look at the paperwork, and I call him, I said, dude, you signed this change order. When I call him, you know what wife wrote in the signature? I've never seen people do this evil to contractor. She made it look like a signature, but she wrote, do not agree in the signature. It blew me away. Like, why would anyone do it, anything like that? I mean, it, you flip in house, you could, you know, leave with a cheaper carpet. I mean, why? Just why? But from legality standpoint of the signature, if someone would do it for, for you, like roofing job, whatever, because they did not sign their name, they signed, do not agree. Do you think it will still uh, stick in court if you sue them? It's, it's a good question. That's a crazy story. I've never heard somebody try and pull something that underhanded. Um, what I know with Sumo Code is, you know, we're tracking IP addresses, we're following all of the same legality of DocuSign and everybody else. But what I tell all of our clients is, I'm not a lawyer, I can't advise you on this. Um, with additional things that we built into Sumo Quote were uh, multiple signatures. So you could have two, three, four, you know, people sign on there. And one of the things you could do on there, is, so you could have, you know, both homeowners sign on there electronically, but then you can always have your, uh, your office manager, your owner sign off on it before it's a fully executed contract. So you've always reserved the right to review it after they've signed it and then to sign off on it yourself to make sure that you agree that they didn't try and slide something in there like that. Because, yeah, it's, there's, there's some underhanded people out there, unfortunately. I never thought about API. Like, it's a good point because if you can prove that they sign it at their device, I think it solves it. Uh, especially if you're dealing with a really big job a lot of money, you know, um, you, you know, it's no longer, I, I think small claims is up to like 7,000. So it's different court even if it's a big a chunk of money. Great answer. Uh, how do you describe Summa Quote to typical roofer? Because roofers, they are not technology advanced uh, or savvy. They usually, you know, a lot of them are still handwriting stuff. So how do you describe Summa Quote to someone who is not, technology savvy. It's the, rather than describing, we always try and show it to them because if we can show it to them, right away they see, oh wow, that was really easy. Because our, our, our interface, how we design Sumo Quote, it feels way more like Instagram or Facebook or something like that as opposed to an old Excel spreadsheet or something really clumsy. And so it ends up feeling really intuitive and fast. Um, when I'm talking with them, there's different things, they often go right away. They, they tend to gravitate to something. Either it's, oh man, this is gonna be way better because 
now everything's standardized and all my sales guys aren't just gonna be making up their own stuff as they go along. So they can standardize and lock things in way better for their team and, and make sure there's some consistency there. Or they love the integration with company cam and that you can add photos in there and mark them up and that they can show the homeowner or the property manager what's going on. So um, yeah, it tends to be if we can show somebody, if they sign up for a demo and just grab 20, 30 minutes with us, that's where really, you know, they see the impact of it really quick and they see just how powerful it can be with their business really, really quickly that way as well. Name one platform or app that in 2021 is obsolete. It's absolutely outdated. Nobody should be using it. Business, personal, like, you know, what's MySpace today? What's dying? I mean, it's, it's the strength and the weakness of it. I think Word and Excel need to die to contractors because they're so basic and generic and they just look so bland. They, there's nothing emotionally for the homeowner to connect to with it. They just see a bunch of words there. Having said that, that's also their greatest strength and why they're gonna keep living for forever, or for a long time, right? Is there are these incredibly powerful tools that can do a ton of things but they were never built for one thing in particular. And so, um, yeah, if you can find the tools out there that specialize at that, that one thing, you know, so Job Nimbus specializes at being a CRM. So don't use Excel to project manage your jobs, use Job Nimbus, right? Sumo Quote specializes at building beautiful professional quotes that have a massive impact on homeowners and clients and property managers. So don't use Word to create a quote in there. Actually, I've got uh, the one guy when I was running our, our sales team here, he came up to me a few years ago and he said, um, hey, just wanted to let you know, I was sitting down with this homeowner. The homeowner said, well, we've kind of said we're gonna use this other company, but you know, sure, you can stop by and, and you've already put your quote together, so I'll sit down with you. So he goes and sits down with the homeowner. Homeowner's got the competitor's quote sitting right there on the table. And so my guy gives him our quote, his quote, right? And, and after about 10 minutes, the guy says, you know what, actually, I'm gonna go with you. I mean, look at this quote, it's so much more detailed. Now, the interesting thing was, my guy's looking at the competitor's quote, he thought the competitor's quote was more detailed, but it was obviously built in Word or Excel or something like that, and it was full of industry jargon, so it's just words, words, words. And as soon as the homeowners start hitting all this jargon, they're like, I don't understand, yeah, whatever, and they just mentally tune out. Whereas with the presentation we gave, it was way more visual, it had their house on the cover, it showed photos of the inspection, it gave videos that they could watch, you know, that they could click on on a, a PDF. Like there was all sorts of things to make it very simple and easy for the homeowner to understand. So it, that simplicity of communication, of making sure they understand is, is powerful and Word and Excel really struggle with that. At Roofing Insights, we actually receive a lot of quotes from contractors. Um, you know, homeowners are getting three, four, five estimates. And uh, I ended a lot of videos in the past, like if you're the homeowner, you don't know who to pick, send us the uh, estimates. It's one of the service and directory that we offer. We will review three, four estimates and we will help you navigate through them what's be better option for you. And man, like I feel like California, I just recently got actually six quotes or six or seven, like about five number and all handwritten. Like California is still like Silicon Valley, yes, but still handwrite all their estimates. And I mean, it's not competitive, like they're roofers, but there are not 3000 of them in LA. There's a fewer companies, they handwrite and Florida is all Excel and Word. Uh, it's all accessorized. They do per item. And when you have like Midwest, it's all like roofing one price. Like nobody item is uh, itemized anything. They just give you bulk price, you know, $25,000 for 25 squares. Here's my price. So uh, how many um, roofers do you feel like still technology not savvy in percentage? Are you talking about 80-20 split? Because I feel like roofing is such a competitive niche, but um, we have professional companies on the rise, all these millennials who got into business in the last couple of years, they all started with the technology, but we still have you know, older guys who just would not adopt. 
Yeah, I want to feel like the more technology savvy companies out there, it's it's growing quick. Uh, so, you know, it was probably 10 years ago, it was probably 10 to 15 percent. Five years ago, you know, maybe 20, 25 percent. I got to feel like we're we're 35, 40 percent. Like it's it's coming on because com uh, contractors are looking at this and recognizing for them to be more efficient and to push more volume but without hiring a whole pile of more people, technology can let you scale so much easier. So an example with our roofing company here, um, there's a couple of things we do to be able to scale quickly and scale up and down. But um, in what we do is we'll, we'll hire on business students in the summers to help write estimates. We'll train them in Xactimate and do some of that stuff. Um, but we also shift some of our, our uh, gutter installers over to doing inspections. So they're already trained to be on the roof and they can go around and do all their, all their inspections and stuff. But with the help of that and with technology, we had our top sales guy this last year sell over $4.6 million of, of roofs. And uh, we had four or five other guys on our team sell over $3 million each. So... The ability for to, for us to put a pile more work through not, without adding a whole pile of additional people, partially because of technology and partially because we found ways to scale up and scale down on the parts that sales guys don't really need to do. We let them focus on selling and, and really excelling at that. So, and I feel like uh, if a contractor loses a job to competition. He also always asks himself, why did he lose? And homeowners are given that feedback often, like they have better presentation or they're more established or whatever the case is. I feel like that also drives the force, uh, you know, to increase our lear learning curve. It does. Well, and you were talking before about, you know, having those three different quotes and the homeowners not being able to tell them apart. Obviously, what we focused on was how do we make it so the homeowner can tell us apart from the other contractors? So have our quote or our presentation look that much more impressive because the salesperson isn't there 100% of the time when the homeowner's signing. The quote is. The, the, the estimate, the proposal that you're giving is there 100% of the time. So one of the things we did is we built a marketing page and we call it how to compare contractors. And so on there, we sort of put the, well, here's Epic Roofing and here's your typical contractor. And we say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, you may be getting other you know, quotes out there. Um, just so you know, I know we can kind of all end up looking, you know, you know, looking the same, sounding the same, even smelling the same. How do you even tell us apart, right? And on the column on the left side, we say, well, these are the most important things to look at. You know, because there's some big differences between us. So what's the warranty? How much insurance coverage do they have? Do they have a full-time safety director? And obviously we've heavy weighted it to things that we are really strong at, but we're positioning ourselves as the obvious choice, but we're doing that right in the quote. So the homeowner can start to evaluate themselves to say, well, look, Epic gave me this thing. Here's eight, 10 different things that I should be comparing contractors on. And here's what Epic is. And then when they start pushing the other contractors for those things, like you don't have to have a, sa a full-time safety director to be safe, but we're large enough where we've got a full-time safety director. So it's kind of that, you know, hey, if you got it, flaunt it, right? So establish to the homeowner that this should be the standard. Um, and, and when you when you insert marketing pages directly into your quote like that, that has a powerful effect then on ultimately closing that deal at the end of the day. And I feel like the biggest marketing slash sales mistake roofers make because there's big debate that's going on between roofers who still roof every day and business owners is there's this hatred going on where roofers say, well, these big companies, they're marketing companies and they're not real roofing companies. And my biggest arguments with that is consumer behavior. Ask yourself this, like, is your hard work enough? Because they think just because they work hard on the roof, 
uh, they always like to claim like my job, my work speaks for myself. No, it doesn't. Because when you go in my house and you show me what you do, I can only judge you by uh, your presentation. Like the same as, you know, it's a job interview. When you go and apply for a job, you can be the hardest worker, but how you dress matter, how you walk matter, how you look matter, everything matters during the job interview. This is job interview. You can be the best on the roof, but now I can only judge you by your piece of paper. Those attention to details has nothing to do with the roof, but it tells me uh, more about quality of the roof as well. People don't get it. They think, okay, I'm the best roofer here. You know, I, I can put chicken scratch estimate here and get the job. No, you can't because they will judge you, your work on the roof by how you present yourself in the house. Yeah, you nailed it. It's how I think about that often is the consistency of brand experience. So you don't show up in there, you know, with a golf shirt on and a filthy rusted out old truck because there's there's a disconnect subconsciously in the homeowner's mind about brand experience and what to expect through there. And so if you can start, it's that thing where your truck should match your salesperson, should match your website, should match production, but should match your quote. And if something is off in there, the brand experience is off and the homeowner starts feeling a little squirrely or just wondering what's going on. And so if you can have a consistent brand experience the whole way through, now you've shown the homeowner, right, exactly what to expect and that you're going to perform at that level, not just on the roof, because everybody says they're going to be phenomenal on the roof. You've got to, you've got to prove it to them through that consistent brand experience. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, that's obviously one of the things we really focused on as a company. Uh, what's your personal best uh, productivity app on your phone? Like that helps you a lot during the day, manage, you know, two companies, uh, your lifestyle. Yeah, calendar app. Calendar? My calendar app uh, ends up getting very full. If it's not in my calendar, it doesn't exist in my mind. So my calendar app sort of runs everything. And if, yeah, I, I, would, I don't know what I would do without that. I used to be able to function without that five, six years ago. But at this point now, um, yeah, I would, I would lose my mind without having my calendar app. Do there. you use uh, basic Apple or Android or you have actually app uh, that's designed for calendar? We're set up with G Suite. So yeah, we've got sort of everything connected with email and calendar and all that. But the, for me, it's the having, um, you know, the ability to add Zoom meetings in there and just have everything connected. So I just go in my calendar, hit the meeting link and I'm straight into my meeting. Uh, so that makes my life way easier. What is the biggest trend that you see in the roofing industry in 2021? What changes the fastest and what's happening right now? I think it still comes down to technology, but it's going to be uh, integrated technology. And this is the thing that we all complain about as roofers, right? Is, man, brilliant software, but one more subscription. Oh, it's painful. So I think you're going to start to see companies like Sumo Quote working and planning product and actual design and integrations and everything with companies like Job Nimbus and companies like Company Cam, uh, Eagle View, um, even Beacon, right? You're gonna start to see these really well-established best in class products that start to create this total seamless experience together. Um, that's gonna be really exciting to see how some of that works. So. Um, yeah, I know there's there's a lot of conversations going on sort of behind the scenes there right now. and But yeah, I think it's just going to be, how do we lean into technology more? How do we make it a more seamless, uh, painless experience for contractors? And, and then how can contractors use that just to scale their business like crazy? Give one advice to the homeowner. To the homeowner. That's a great question. Homeowner who, who is in the process of buying a new roof, getting estimates, you know, shopping on the market for materials, for companies to install them. Kind of like homeowner who has 25 year old roof and needs a new one in 2021. You know what, it's do your research. There's so many ways you can research out there right now. Um, we all know that there's a pile of roofing contractors winning work out there that give a terrible experience that if they had Google reviews, it would all be at one or two or three stars. Like there's still, there's a lot of easy ways at homeowners fingertips that they can learn and understand and see what's going on with the business. 
um, before they sign a contract. So for a homeowner, Google reviews is a big one. Um, you know, uh, referrals. You know, are there are there referral sheets or, or at, you know, are there referral videos? Are there ways that the contractor can communicate? Here's referrals and pass them along easily to the homeowner and stuff. Um, it's not hard things to do for the contractor. You have to be intentional with it. You have to build a little bit of it. But um, yeah, homeowners, it's like it's that same concept of when you go out to even on a small thing like going out to eat. You don't go to a restaurant with one star reviews. You don't go into an empty restaurant where nobody's eating there because that, it's just that's telling you something about the food. So yeah, do your research, um, figure out what's going on because it's not that hard these days and contractors should be able to show you that stuff. Give one advice to brand new business owner, roofing business owner or contractor. There's a lot of really good people in the industry. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, people that maybe not be, maybe aren't quite as ethical, but there's a lot of really good ones too. Um, and there's a lot of people that are willing to coach and share how their business has grown, their experiences. Um, you know, I mean, even just so in the space of uh, a new contractor coming on, trying to figure out some of the things to do, right? Like there's, there's Roofing Insights Business School, there's Roofing Academy, like there's, there's some different places to go. Um, you know, I think there's some really reputable ones that care about their image, that do the research, um, that are at conferences or, I mean, creating conferences like, those are ones that are really invested in and they're gonna be a part of this industry and are leading this industry. So um, I'd say connecting with one of those is great. And then there's a lot of wisdom and experience you can gain there, even on the technology tools that you set up or products that you're installing or, or warranties that you offer. There's a lot of details that go into these businesses. So connect with good people in the industry and a lot of them are really happy to help. And the last question I have for you, give advice to seasoned roofing business owner who's stuck in his ways, always complains about technology, about where the world is going, kind of like negative, don't wanna share his knowledge because he knows it all, he made it, he wants to keep it to himself, kind of like, don't touch me guy, advice to him. You know what, I was talking with, uh, I was talking with one of the head people over at Eagle View and he used an interesting word or, or combination of words. He, he called it coopetition, right? So can you, can you cooperate and can you be competitors at the same time? And his comment, and I thought it was really wise, was those that can embrace coopetition are gonna go way further, way faster in the industry. Um, and if you, you sort of try and create and defend a small silo unto yourself, it's going to remain small likely. Um, so it's the same type of approach that we're taking even with SumoQuo, right? And I listed some of those companies earlier, right? If we can develop actively with Job Nimbus, with Company Cam, with Eagle View, with Peak, and like how much further and how much more powerful can our products become when they are seamlessly tied together and they're all best in class? the growth of what we can do is exponential, but you've gotta be willing to share and recognize that just because we're working with them doesn't mean that somebody else that might be a competitor doesn't get to work with them as well. You've gotta you've got be able to recognize the industry is very big and that we can all win and you know, uh, the the rising, rising tides raise all ships, so to speak, right? Love it, absolutely love it. Thank you so much for your time, man. I appreciate you. Good luck with the Summa Quote and Epic. Um, I cannot imagine running two such big companies. You're doing well. Hopefully borders will open soon so we can come and do company tour with Epic Roofing. I'm dying to see Canada again in the first place, but also a solid roofing player in your market. Thank you for the interview, for the questions. Thank you, sir. Dimitri, appreciate it, man. Thanks so much. Really great to be here. Hope you guys enjoyed this interview. Give it a like if you did. Comment below if you have any questions for myself or Ryan. We'll be back to his place uh, as soon as they open borders. Hopefully in 2021. Cannot wait to see Canadian roofing company. I'll see you guys in the next video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so yet. <music>